Trance and Recalcitrance, a 20-year retrospective exhibition of Poltroon Press, will run from April 1st through May 31st on the third floor of the main library. Dominic Riley and John Demerit from Pacific Center for the Book Arts spoke with the founders of Poltroon Press, Francis Butler and Alastair Johnston. Hello and welcome back to At the Public Library, John and Dominic's show, and we're going to be talking today to two great friends and uh, famous printers from Berkeley. But before we do, let me just remind you that it is St. Patrick's Day. We're both wearing our identical shades of non-green to celebrate uh, the day. And uh, we're here in the, what could only be described really as the labyrinthine bowels of the third floor of the public library. Actually, we're 30 feet below the surface of the earth, Dominic. Oh, we are. Yeah. So when I went up, I really went you down. You were really up. going down. It's kind of scary down It there. is. It's, um, well, we're in, I think, what you might call an environment, a sort of Vincent Price environment, wouldn't you say, John? Yeah, I would. Did you know Vincent Price could sneeze with his eyes open? Could he? Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. Anyway, without anyway. further ado, let us move on. Uh, yeah. Today's show that we're going to be looking at is a show called Trance and Recalcitrance. 20 years of fine printing at the Poltroon Press in Berkeley. And we're going to be talking to the proprietors of the press, Francis Butler and Alistair Absolutely. Johnson. We should start out by saying that you are a small press. Uh, if you, and you do letterpress printing. Maybe we should begin by you giving us a short description of exactly what is a yeah. small press. How does letterpress printing differ from other kinds of printing? And uh, well, I don't know if you can you see it, it, but this is a yeah. small press right here. How That's do you a fit tiny into press, a small press? <laughs> Being so large. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, well, we've expanded over the years, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. But you have artifacts, right? Artifacts, you, you're right, going to yes. show us what, what letterpress is. Well, letterpress is. printing is essentially um, printing from pieces of small metal called movable type. Yeah. Which. Um, What's that compose, device in your hand? This is a you're... composing stick. Uh -huh. And you compose these. Um, That's not this kind of thing that um, Sir Henry Wood used to use. No, that oh. was a uh, conducting baton. Oh, right, okay. So you're setting a line of type. You're setting a, you set a line of type, and you put yeah. in little blank spaces yeah. for the spaces. Uh, what would you call spaces. those? Yeah. And then um, it's a very time-consuming and laborious process, as you can see. Yeah, you look tired. But when you get to the end of the line... You don't want to eat your sandwich after doing that either. No, that's right. Let's poison it. Well, it's good for the complexion, I hear. Uh. Um, when you get to the end of the line, you put in blank spaces to fill out the line, mm -hmm. and then you add one of these things, which is called a lead or a slug, and uh, you have your line there, which is, says Pence Pluntros. Oh, which is an anagram <laughs> of my favorite press in Berkeley, Poltroon Press. Poltroon Press. Isn't that wonderful? And this then is, um, this type is then locked up oh. in a chase, which is then put into a but you could also set multiple lines of type in yeah. the same way that you've just oh, done. Oh, look at that, yeah. You lock it up like this. Uh -huh. Now that's wood type you have there. This is wood type, and you lock it up, and then um, this metal frame locks mm -hmm. into a bed of a printing press, mm -hmm. and then you smash pieces of paper against it after inking it. After inking it. And you end up with multiple copies. Great. So. so this is very close to the mode that Gutenberg devised in 1450-some-odd. So we're saying not a lot has changed then in terms of the work that you're doing? Well, up to letterpress, not a lot right. has changed. It was for the printing technique for 400 years since then. Yeah. I mean, it's gone into various other technologies. And are, great. are you exploring any other kinds of printing technologies, or are you still primarily a letterpress? Well, press? We, we, have a, we used a broken Xerox machine for a oh. while, which is a color Xerox machine, which was interesting, and, and uh, we've used other forms of uh, printing. One of the great innovations was the introduction of linotype 100 oh, years ago. Oh, yes, yeah. right. Where you set your type um, and you ended up with a, a whole line, a line O type. And it makes it a lot easier yeah. to deal with. You don't have the, the problem of your type all pieing. This is just this is yeah. a solid block. You're just keying in that. You type it, essentially. Yeah. Excuse me. Right. And, and uh, that's you great. end up with your page of, of metal, it's a lot but, easier to handle. But mm -hmm. you have to throw this away once the job's done, right? Right. Unlike this, which melt goes it, back into the tray. You melt it back down and use it yeah. again. You melt line and type down. And if you make a mistake, mm -hmm. you have to reset right. the line. Mm -hmm. Sure. But these machines are very big, the line type machines, right? I mean, you, you wouldn't have one at home in your well, press. We, we you, do. Do. <laughs> you do? You have a line type machine? 
They're humongous. Wow. They are, and they're very uh, kind of Rube Goldbergish with uh, yeah. thirty thousand moving parts. Wow, gosh! And you have magazines of different fonts that you can use. Right, for... and each size of each typeface requires a different set of yeah, matrices. Sure. So you need a lot of sure. a lot of uh, brass and right. uh, metal. But it really so is a great time saver. Uh, not really, because yeah. you spend so much time working on the machine that it'd be quicker to okay. handset it. Handset it. So why <laughs> do you use it? Uh, usually, if I'm doing longer works, prose uh -huh. works, or longer books of poetry, uh -huh. mm. we use it for that. Right. Now, can you talk briefly about how you both got into letterpress? What, what, what uh, first exposed you to that? Well, actually, Alastair was uh, working for a printer who did university press books in Santa Barbara. And meanwhile, in Berkeley, I had taken some classes in letterpress, mm -hmm. and um, I was invited to teach a class in the Bancroft <coughs> Library. And so I, uh, I had, um, it had been a year or two since I'd done any work, and I went down to refurbish my skills at a local letterpress, mm -hmm. and Alistair was an apprentice there. Oh. And he and I started working right. together. What was the name of that press? That was Wesley Tanner's Arif press. Arif Arif press. press. Oh, yes, right. And um, I had a letterpress. I had bought an old Vandercook 219, and it was in this large fabric printing company that I owned and operated at the time. And so, um, through various misadventures, um, Wesley threw Alistair out onto the street, and he Not came exactly. and worked at my press. No, that's we started it that once way. Again. <laughs> well, I think we should have a little melodrama in the. Well, public come on! Library. We don't want to fight on public television, do we? Um, although it is cable, yeah, it is cable. That kind of thing does happen quite a lot. Um, I mean, I can uh, strangle Francis right now. You can now. do. <laughs> So she's answered your question, really, about how you got into it, or is there more to that story? I have nothing more to add. OK, <laughs> that's good, right. Um, and it's all history of the, And the, the Bay Area, Berkeley in the Bay Area does have a pretty rich tradition of letterpress printing. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. like that's why I, I came here, because mm -hmm. when I was in Santa Barbara, um, I knew Graham McIntosh, who'd been in San Francisco in the 50s, mm -hmm. running White Rabbit Press. And um, I was just getting interested in small press publishing through the poetry. So you came here for exposure to that? Well, I knew that this was kind of the hotbed of where yeah. it was going on. Right. There was uh, Cranium yeah. Press, Zephyrus Image, Five Trees Press. Yeah. Um, we're all... Uh, Who were some of the people that inf influenced or helped you to learn the craft of letterpress? Um, well, Francis primarily uh -huh. um, and Wesley, but... Um, Wesley you know, Tanner. Two years working in the trade letterpress shop. Mm -hmm. This is where I picked up all the, right. the sort of mechanical part and then the typographic stuff. You just learn by looking at books. Right. Yeah. So after you two guys met, uh, you founded the press April the first, nineteen seventy-five. Right. Mm -hmm. um, talk a bit about the early, the, you know, the very early days of the press and the kind of stuff that you were that you were printing. We the first few things we did were our own projects, little poet, poetry books, uh -huh. and um, Francis started working on uh, our first big book, Confracti Mundi Rudera. Yeah. Okay. This was our first uh, large-scale project in which um, we worked out a. One mm. of the two streams of activity in the press. Uh, One of them, part of the press is a purely literary press. The other half of the press is exploring the way in which people now use visual imagery for sophisticated communication. And mm. most of the books that I have worked on and the so projects after that have been oriented towards exploring the ways that people use image and space to get parallel information to that that they learn through reading, that they can gather in through the institutional culture, which is language and its transmission through universities and so on and right. so on. And so this book has a lot of visual jokes that have to do with turning the page, looking in and out of images, for example. Mm -hmm. Here's a poem about fog. Alcatraz, gray this morning, barely cuts the rim of the bay. And you can't see the text very easily because it's printed inside. But it's there. But it's, oh. you can see If you it press it you, down, you can see. You can yeah. It. And, and it is about fog. This is Confracti Mundi Rudera, Rudera. right? Yes. Which, um, might... It's a phrase from Thomas Love Peacock, which means fragments of a ruined world. And it's a, a series of poems. And then this one about, there's a little section about water. And then there's another poem about water. Mm. For Sir, mm -hmm. the Viking leader, first off the boat. Mm -hmm. so we swim out with gifts. And then there's a double page spread wherein they are swimming out with gifts, and one mm. of them is saying, Sutton, who? <laughs> <laughs> so this book um, is indeed. 
fragments tied together by visual puns and jokes. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of this book, I started on another book that um, used the text by Tom Rayworth. Mm -hmm. And Alistair will talk about our connection with Tom Rayworth later. But this, the but Rayworth book, is a much more elaborate version of this page-turning joke sequence uh -huh. because the Rayworth text itself, logbook, is about a series of pages that were found after a wreck. And Alistair very carefully set them all so they were justified and ended at the end of a page regardless, right. which is a very exotic thing to have managed. Uh, tremendous mm -hmm. uh, This book is um, color letterpress. Each plate, each color is a separate plate, mm. but it also has some Pochoir, which is a French stencil process that I will discuss in a, moment, in a moment. And there are sequences within the book wherein you read one page, the illustration wraps around to the next page, but the information that is on the next page actually refers back to the page before. Page before. So that the notion of sequence and spacing as a way of learning things is played out. Here's one where mm. the um, text is about overflowing the river something something and using the, the word overflown which is not in fact the past participle of to overflow but Rayworth suggests the past participle of the possibility of overflying so after you have the discussion of overflown on this page there is someone who's overflying, overflying. but at this point you would have to go back to find out that it, this person is about to be shot down so um, mm. we we went on with this kind of maneuver for a while, but Alistair then proceeded to move off into more um, examinations of pure literature. Right. Now, uh, you, tell us a little bit, Alistair, about the, um, the sort of literature. You talked about, about the press tradition. Talk about the literary tradition of the area uh, and, and how that ties in with the work that you at uh, the Poltroon Press uh, have been doing. Well, uh, um, California didn't really have much of a literary tradition, of course, until the gold rush. I mean, there were writings about it, but mm. um, there was a press tradition here starting after the gold rush with a huge influx of, of uh, people. And um, in fact, the, probably the most commonly printed thing in San Francisco in the 19th century was salmon tin labels, huh. they were lithographed. Huh. Um, oh. So there was huge um, lithographic presses. And um, by the 20th century, you had a literary tradition sort of springing up, you know, uh, Steinbeck, Robert Louis Stevenson was mm -hmm. here for a while, yeah. and he had a little press. His um, his stepson um, had a little tabletop press, and he and Robert Louis Stevenson printed a magazine together up in, I think, St. Helena yeah. when they were hmm. living there. Um, but for me, in terms of my interest, the, the uh, literature that starts after the Second World War is um, sort of crucial, the, the, um, the Beat era. Mm. Um, the famous people associated with City Lights, but also the anti-beat movement of uh, the Jack Spicer, Robert right. Duncan. Yeah, group. and this this leads perhaps into your this book, uh, the Arhan Press. Right. Well, when uh, I when I moved to San Francisco, um, I was sort of looking for this uh, you know yeah. this literary tradition. Sure. And um, Arhan Press had only ceased publishing about uh, ten years before we started Poltroon Press, mm -hmm. but there really wasn't much information about them. So I decided to research them and write a bibliography. Right. And so um, I found the press archive. What was your, ex what was your initial exposure to this press? Uh, a Jack Spicer book called Heads of the Town Up to the Ether, which was one oh. of my favorite books, a very strange and quirky book with um, lithographs by Fran Herndon and wonderful series of poems by Spicer, one of the great San Francisco mm -hmm. authors. Uh. So I found the press archive over at the Bancroft Library oh, yeah, right. and um, started working on, um, you know, putting it together, the, putting together the history of the press. So there are letters from Ginsburg, um, Brian Geisen. Oh, this is a Brian Geisen uh, illustration. Yeah, right? which he'd yeah. sent Dave Hazelwood and was in a box at the, the Bancroft. So uh, and how, how did you re reproduce this for the book? We, uh, f well, this is a very kind of uh, backward way to go about it, but we photographed the um, original art, which mm -hmm. is in three colors, mm -hmm. and then we made three photostats of it and carefully painted out each of the uh, each of the colors we didn't want. So we ended up with three plates. It was kind of a subtractive right. uh, process. David Lance Gortz works that way. Oh, he does. Oh, he does. Yes, he does. And then Therefore, here's was a letter from William Burroughs explaining how to do a cut up. And there's a page oh, yes. of type, and you could actually rip the page out and 
turn you, it into four. What do you do? Do you want to show us how you do it? <laughs> no. Well, it's just tough paper. It's, oh yeah, it's yeah. mylar, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. We could take a photocopy later, perhaps, and do the cheap. We'll tear it up. Yeah. And then there were little drawings by uh, Michael McClure. Uh -huh. mm. um, can you show us the, the newspaper article that you actually set in letterpress type, the movable type we saw this earlier, a very, to look like a, a newspaper? Yeah, it's from the San Francisco Chronicle, a very funny article called The Poets Cry Out, Zen Nuts, Hippies and Squares. And I set it to look <laughs> like exactly like bad newspaper typesetting. I just followed the original. And to give the flavor of the, uh, <laughs> right. the era, I thought it would be good to have um, this you know, actual uh, account. There's a, there's a wonderful... Uh, it's, it's, I won't read you the whole thing, but there's a wonderful thing that says something about a few of the blonde girls wearing black stockings chewed gum and slouched against the wall in the back, obviously missing the nuances, but the rest were appreciative enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of early sexism. Sex. Early sex. Sex. Oh, I'm glad I wasn't around then, aren't you? <laughs> well, I was around, actually. You were? Yes. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> uh, He's well preserved. You, know, you talked a little bit in the catalogue about the way that this type was set in the stick and then... Uh, well, it, the, I felt the wobbliness that, of it. I yeah. Think. yeah, I felt that in order to preserve the spirit of the beat era, yes. that I should um, have some sort of spontaneity involved. So, I improvised this, the text right. as yeah. I was setting it, and then I put it on the bed of the press and proofed it, and then after mature consideration, took out all the slanderous and libelous things that were in there. Mm -hmm. and, That's a uh, good idea. Um, Apparently, still you don't not always enough. do that, do you? Well, there was a section back here where uh, there was a big fight that they had with Robert Duncan over a uh -huh. book of his called A Book of Resemblances, which they ended up not printing, although they'd set the type and so on. And uh, after setting all this stuff, I thought, uh oh, I can't really, really get into all this mudslinging. So I'd already printed the backup. So I had a whole bunch of zincs made, and so all these illustrations <laughs> were to fill up the, uh, the oh, space so where the, uh, the quasi libelous uh, right. material. Uh, that must so have been very slanderous. We moved quite pages, a bit, Alice. Uh, pages yeah. of slander. Uh, Good. Yes. Well, thanks for showing that. And uh, we're going to talk now about right, what I mean, to call ECAs. EACs. Oh, yeah. Extracurricular yeah. activities. I mean, Alistair, you, obviously you were involved in the poetry and literary scene as well as being a printer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think recently you've become very involved, especially after a trip to Africa and African music. Right. Uh, film, literature, and you now have a radio program on KUSF, which Tuesday is US nights, Tuesday nights. FM. Which actually, we've yeah. already plugged on this program, haven't we? So we've now I think you'll have to plug our program on your program. I will do yeah. that. <laughs> and if you have a program, please plug all our programs. Yeah. I'm wondering, usually he gives away free tickets to yeah. things. This lures in the audience. Uh, and right. If he's going to plug you, you'll have to have free tickets for something. Well, we're not yeah. live. You just give them to all your friends anyway, don't you? <laughs> yeah, it's free tickets here. And, uh, and your work, also, we're very interested in what I like to call, or I guess you call also, Poetry Gardens. Yes. Can you I, talk about that? After doing some books for the first 10 years of the press, mm. I really moved off to do a lot of text in gardens and mm. in larger sculptural installations. I started off with just small pieces, like a 16-foot long wire piece that had mm. hands on it. And if you walked past it to read the letters on each hand, the hands waved. Yeah. <laughs> And the text was from a Stevie Smith poem that Alistair pointed out. I'm not waving, she said. I'm, not, I'm too far out, she said, and not waving, but drowning. And then I moved on to do um, large scale installations, one called Space Printing, that was about, indeed, the ways that you use space to learn. Mm. And then I did a series of shows about shadow in the visual arts. And I did a shadow garden for myself, which uh -huh. still exists. It's called a shadow um, dictionary of shadow effects. And the latest book that I've done is about gardens that are mm. about shadow and things of that sort. Mm. And I did um, some gardens for um, a hospital in Seattle that involves shadow. It's very difficult because there's hardly public, any. These were public installations that you did. That's right. Hardly um, any what? Sunlight? There's hardly any sun, sun in, in Seattle. Seattle, so shadow is difficult to achieve, but it was lit so mm -hmm. that at night there would be. That's great. And um, we are going to have in our exhibition some of the the smaller and these gardens have worked their way done. into some of your printed pieces. Oh, yes. I, my, my particular yeah. favorite is in your garden on a sort of cuboid uh, shaped planter. In mosaic, you have the large word excess, right? And this became 
uh, part of the title of a book called Western Excess, right? Yes. Uh, which is your other book um, done in pochoir, which I think you're now going to show us, right? Yes. About 10 years ago, I did a pochoir portfolio called New Dryads or Waiting for Your Call, which was about fashion plates or ordinary fashion. And I have now done another portfolio that is colored by pochoir, which is a stencil process. And this one is about excessive gardens. And I used for its title page a drawing of my own shadow garden in Berkeley. This one, as you see, is a, um, a planter with a lot of extra babies called uh -huh. excess. And the way you do the plates for a portfolio like this is first draw the image. Uh -huh. And these are done with mm -hmm. uh, rapidograph pens and take forever yeah. and ever. And Francis, pochoir? It's a word meaning stencil, stencil. in French. Another French word. And I will show you how to do that very yeah. briefly in a moment. Now, is this transferred to mylar? Or? No, then you get the, the drawing photographed uh -huh. on a large camera and get a negative. Uh -huh. That is used to make a metal plate. This is actually magnesium. Uh -huh. and this is uh, 18 by 24. And from this plate, you put it down on the press. So will you take the negative to an engraver and they'll make the plate for you? I, I do a lot of the work myself, but I get the etching done by right. someone who has a large etching right. machine. And then this is a printed image from that plate. And at this point, I mount this, I, I punch the image and mount right. it so that it's in registration. Those are your registration right. marks. And I put on um, waxed stencil paper, which is called Easy Cut, and oh, cut uh, out. Uh, so that's it, held on in on these little, little pins. With pins. Little pins. So and I cut out is... these squares, which are going to be a blue color. Actually, I only cut out half of them. The other blue squares are cut on a second plate <gasps> because they have to they have to register so closely that it would yeah. be too frail. Uh, and at this point, oh, I yeah. then. I have your paints here. I then use a, cup, which I'll hold. Um, paint, which is usually very, very dry, and a little is cloth that a, to clear is that a gouache out the you're extra using? paint. Yes, but uh -huh. you can use many different kinds of paint. I've used watercolor and acrylic. Mm -hmm. And I stencil in through this wax paper stencil all the holes in this one color. Right. And eventually, I haven't done it all here, but eventually it looks like this. And this if is... I just hold this up, we can see get an idea the small of the area of blue that Francis has just colored in there, which is kind of corresponds to that to part there. Now this is an addition you're working on. And this, yes. What, and what's the addition size? Well, there are uh, 45 plates that are involved in this book. Yeah. And there are going to be 30 copies, which will wow. take me for, it already yeah. has taken me forever, but it will take so you me get quite the, a bit yeah. longer. So you, that the, gives you an idea you of the labor have, involved. How many stencils, say, for, for a this thing like this? This one has about 20 stencils and yeah. about 45 different color placements. I don't mm -hmm. have to use a, different, a complete sheet for every single for every one. And sometimes, mm, colors, mm, yeah. mottled colors like this, you actually put the color through in small stencil areas yeah. and then wash it out right. so it all blends. Um, will, is there text with this book? Yes, it when? has about 15 pages of text. Some of it is incorporated into picture right. images. Mm -hmm. Others is just, it's a very odd book because it's this size, 17 mm -hmm. by 22. And it'll be produced in loose folios that will it's come in, in a, a box. box. That has a tile cover saying yeah, right. excess, naturally. That's great. Well, thanks for showing us that, um, yes, Francis. Yes, you can all rush out and do it any moment now. Absolutely, yes. Well, yeah. now she's shared the secrets. With and the book logbook we looked at earlier was oh, yes. also an example of some Where is that? Can you printing? just hand us the yeah. logbook? Because this leads us on very nicely yeah. to Alistair's new book. This is Logbook, which was a book that I think you did in 77, was that right? That's great, yeah. Right. Um, which had those lovely illustrations also uh, done in pochoir, right? <coughs> One or two. Of Turn them it that way, done. Right, oh, Most sorry. Most of them were, we were mechanically separated. These are an early book. Now, you did this with Tom Rayworth, and you've had a, a poultry, and you've had a long <coughs> association with Many poets, artists, mm -hmm. uh, writers that you've enjoyed working with, and one of them is Tom Rayworth, who's right. an English poet, right? Yeah, and uh, another is Philip Whelan, who's uh -huh. a San Francisco right. 
poet. We've done and you'll several also things. Published several books of poets that you yeah. Enjoy Daryl Gray. With. We published three or four of his books. So yeah. if there's a poet we get along with and like their work, you right. know, we might as well keep publishing them. Right. And uh, <coughs> we have right here. Yeah, this is our fourth book with Tom Rayworth. We mm -hmm. did, uh, other than the log book, we did two other poetry books, The Mask in 1976 and Nichtvar Rosie, which was a book that he wrote in the 60s. Um, and we had never appeared, and we published it in about 1979. Right. This is Muted Hawks, the latest book from Poultry and Press, one of them. And um, this is also, I believe, Alistair, your first real adventure into additioned uh, art, right? Yeah, I've done a few one-off um, experimental projects, but this was one where I took some ideas that I've been working with, with um, experimental relief printing. Mm -hmm. um, that are essentially monoprints, but then found a way to recreate them 40 times. So there are slight variations in all of them, but they were right. all done um, on the press in the, the style that's called hot printing that was invented by Hendrik Workman in uh -huh. uh, Holland in the 30s. And he basically found things in the print shop, such as here we've got some broken wood type, uh -huh. um, and the background is uh, electrical tape, and you just mount them <sighs> type high. I just took a piece of type high furniture and strapped the tape onto it and yeah. then ran the press the over The furniture is the pieces of wood that, that fill up the spaces yeah. exactly. inside the and press. And you just put tape over that. Yeah, and actually there is this is metal furniture here that I just... Yeah. Um, <clears throat> one of the great innovations in press design has been the adjustable bed. Right. So you can raise the you bed raise. of the press. So, so if, if I understand it, normally these things here would be... Uh, lower than type high. They would be than lower than the, the level they of the type, print. so they wouldn't print. They're invisible. They fill up the and you've space. You have an adjustable them. bed that will raise them. I raise them up to, to print. And, and these uh, this is wooden furniture. Uh, pieces of furniture also print, yeah. yeah. Now, it's, it's a very delicate thing because you don't want to trash your rollers and also sure. you don't want to put oh, yeah. holes in the paper, so you still have to get everything planar. It all has to be relatively flat. I mean, the texture of the wood has created... Right. A surface here, more impression would make this darker, less would make it lighter. So right. I was playing with the balance uh, between the the, the uh, impression and the inking, and then there are other things happening in here, um, like these lines are. Uh, this is cardboard that I mounted type high. This little strip is a piece of floor linoleum mm -hmm. printed twice in two different colors. It has, a look, of, out of it has a look of marble paper. I don't yeah, you can see yeah. it. And it's the most amazing collection of um, uh, metaphorical uh, Im imagery um, yeah. strung together. Um, and it's a gorgeous... And Dominic's done concertina. a very nice concertina-style binding. Yes, and it actually plays yeah. Auprès de ma blonde. <laughs> yeah. It is... It is second favorite book binder. I think so, and the first yeah. favorite book binder is... Um, Me. It's you, I think, yeah. yeah. We've pretty much covered all the bases, haven't we, really? which, yeah. is, which is very interesting. And, um, and we don't have to plug you in our pro Alistair's program since you just we did it. We shamelessly promoted ourselves. Yes, yeah. well... <laughs> Yes, well, we're not being paid very much, and I always say, I'm not going to complain to the city of uh, San Francisco. And they have put us in the basement, after all. Yes, but we're... Subterranean. But we're not being cut, are we? Not yet. Yeah. And I, I would like to remind you that the whole reason that we are here today is to remind you and plug the, uh, the show that Alistair and Francis will be having, the Poltroon Press, Trance and Recalcitrance, the private voice in the public realm, running April, April 1st through May 31st, San Francisco Public Library, the South Wing, the third floor. We hope you can come and see it. It's a wonderful show. And from me, John Demerit. And from me, Dominic Riley. And from Alistair Johnson. Here. Francis Butler. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming, coming and sharing with us your work, demonstrating your artifacts and your fine uh, letterpress work from the last 20 years. And we'll see you, I think, what, next month? Perhaps? See you next month. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>